absolutely. All right, hi everyone. Welcome to our June Local Phonology Leader monthly call. My name is Samantha Brewer. I'm the Volunteer Engagement Coordinator for the USA National Phonology Network. And I'm here with Michelle and Elizabeth, a couple of our fabulous leaders. Would you guys mind introducing yourselves? Tell us a little bit about your program and something neat that you've noticed in phonology this month. Sure, um, I'm happy to start. Hi, I'm Michelle Peters, and um, I am a volunteer for the American River Conservancy currently, and I just became a local phonology leader this spring with Samantha and wonderful cohort that we are keeping in touch and all those wonderful things. Um, our program is just starting. We actually just made our first observation last week. Um, yeah, and um, I haven't entered it yet, but that, there are more details on that. I'm still confirming, refining all kinds of things about our site, our plant list. Um, I'm in communication with um, Susan Mazur at the University of Santa Barbara, who's the California Phonology Project leader, uh, to kind of just make sure we're setting up for research grade uh, potential. Um, very exciting. I have like five volunteers who've completed the observation training. And yeah, and um, working on more and I'm working off of my program model that I developed and I'm continuing to refine. Um, and anyway, it's really exciting. And um, something recent, um, I just figured out how to, you know, really tell, not, not when I'm far away, but when I'm pretty close to an oak tree, I can tell what's going on. I can tell the female parts, the male parts, and I saw the cutest little acorn I've ever seen in my life. If you like miniatures, you know, if you like geek out on miniatures, it's like the tiny little acorn and it had all its parts, had the little top, had the little point, was green. Um, that was exciting. That was just a couple of days ago. <laughs> so <laughs> that's that's it. Sorry, it took me a minute. That is so cute. Did you get a picture of it? Because I know those are really hard to find, the little tiny baby acorns sometimes. Sorry, I already muted. Um, I did. I, um, I every time I'm out, I'm always taking pictures now because <laughs> you know for our own, um, you know, our own purposes, but also hopefully to develop the um, the guides as well, the photo guides. So I'll, I'll send it to you. Oh, that's great. Well, congratulations on your volunteers and the backing to like make sure that you have like some good, you know, scientific. Um, purposes for it. That's so freaking cool. It's really great to hear. Thank you. All right, Thank Elizabeth, you. go for it. Hello, I'm Elizabeth Finney. I use she, her pronouns, and I uh, work for the Vermont Department of Forest Parks and Recreation, and I'm a local phonology leader for a research project that we have that has study areas across the state and observers across the state. Um, and this is, we're going into our second year of uh, observing uh, with a focus on three uh, invasive plant species that are common in the um, forested areas of um, northern New England. Uh, we're monitoring um, bittersweet, uh, buckthorn, and a honeysuckle. And um, an observation as of late, Oh, my chives are flowering. I I find them so beautiful um, that I I always let like a small section of them go to flower. <laughs> I recently saw my first onion flowers and I was just blown away by how pretty they are. I'm so glad that your chives are flowering too. Are they also like puffballs at the top? I've never I don't think I've seen like chives specifically. Yeah, yeah, they're like tiny little, tiny little um, spheres. Yeah, the 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 allium flowers are all really gorgeous, and um, uh, these ones are also kind of purple and spherical. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. Well, thank you both for sharing. Um, Elizabeth's program with uh, Vermont Invasives is just a phenomenal program too. So I'm gonna put a link to that one in. Um, the comments for this video. And Michelle, also, if you have any links to your program or your conservancy that you'd like us to link in there too, um, let me know. Um, 
But yeah, so today, um, oh, actually, before I go into it, do you guys have any questions about anything um, leader related or data related or anything at all? Go for it, Elizabeth. So um, maybe ju just shy of about a month ago, we had a frost event. Um, so like towards the end of May, we had a, a pretty severe frost event across the state. And not all um, plant species were were impacted. Um, and for our study in particular, the the buckthorn and the honeysuckle were impacted, but the bittersweet were at a couple of our sites. Um, the leaves went kind of um, ghostly, like the like translucent and white, and then like shriveled up, and then they they started regrowing leaves. Um, but uh, we've been bantering back and forth amongst the observers about how we should go back and um, record that most clearly. Um, there's some debate over whether that counts as colored leaves or not. I know that there's some um, some information in the description that talks about discoloration from um, you know drought or other sort of stressors like that um, but like <laughs> like complete loss of of um, gosh I don't know what like the, the technical thing is like a loss of chlorophyll like I'm not sure what causes them to go that that like ghostly white um, but we weren't exactly sure how to record it other than in the notes but we weren't sure what like phenophase to check. And that was buckthorn, you said? Uh, bit of the bittersweet, the, oh, the bittersweet. Yeah. Right. I would say I'm I'm looking it up right now just so um I don't tell you wrong because sometimes my gut of what <laughs> I would do is not actually exactly what we would do. Um I will say while it's loading, um uh Dilkamara, is that what you said? The oh wait, Oriental bit. Is it oriental little bittersweet or is it the climbing nightshade? It, yeah, it's the Celastris apiculatus. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, let me see this. Uh, bug, 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 bug. Fruits, ripe fruits. Do, do, do. Flowers, colored leaves. Typically, it's, or yellow or brown due to drought or other stresses. Yes, I would say yes for colored leaves okay. when that was happening. Even though um, they weren't yellow or brown. <laughs> yes, because it okay. was still something was going on with the chlorophyll and an abiotic stressor. Yeah, yeah, and it was clearly not, you know, little damage or dieback or something like it was from something that happened that was major to okay. the plant. And it's going to affect cool. the phenology because it's going to affect like yeah, yeah the amount of energy it gets and and all those things. Um, and then when it grew new leaves, I would even mm -hmm. include those again. If it's got breaking leaf buds and all that, if you saw that again after that, yeah, record yeah. that again okay. and put it in the comments as well. It's like second okay. breaking leaf buds after a frost event or something. It's That's super traumatic. There were um, a number of, like the, the sumac and the beach in particular were hit really, really hard. Oh. Um, and like uh, I have colleagues that are trying to monitor beach leaf disease and that's going to be like basically impossible this season because it doesn't show up as well on the second crop of leaves. So uh, yeah, so many like interesting components of it. But apparently also knotweed was hit really hard because um, it was only at, at that point in the month, it was probably only, um, you know, a few feet tall, the stalks in the areas where it was um, already emerged. Um, and it it went that like dark rusty red that it gets over winter um, and had to regrow. So, <laughs> whoa, that's yeah. wild. <laughs> yeah, I would definitely record all those. It's like yeah, if you have changing leaf color and everything died from this frost, and because then you're gonna see that in the graph, and people will know yeah. like to be able to look more into that. And especially like if a lot of people report that, um, you know, that's just information. I don't know what would be out there, but the white one is so weird. Cause I, 
when I think of white, I think of like here we have like these grape skeletonizer moths and they eat all the soft tissue and basically leave the venation. So you have like skeleton grape leaves, grape leaves. Yeah. yeah, it's the best. Like I know they impact grape leaves, but grape skeletonizer moth is just my favorite like name for a moth because they're black <laughs> and they look like goth. And then they make just the skeleton leaves on the grapes. And um, but you know, the grape, the leaves are just, you have these grapevines and the leaves are all clear, but that, that's not what happened. They still have the tissue on the leaves and they're just white. Is that what you're describing for yours then or? Yeah. Yeah. It, it's like, um, oh, what's that kid's book? Benicula. Did you ever read that story? Oh, I guess. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's just, just like that. That's so it's like wild. all the colors gone. Yeah. Oh, that is fascinating. Yeah, it must have broken apart the chlorophyll or something. See, see I don't yeah. know. This is just me speculating. I'm like, okay, what's the basic? Oh, same here, here, same here. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, did they like pop all those little vesicles? Or Yeah, that's wild. Because not all, of, not every plant does that with frost, just turn white like that. Wow. No. Anyway, yes, colored leaves, put in the comments from the frost. And then cool. if they're breaking leaf buds again, then you have breaking leaf buds again and increasing leaf size again and all that. Um, cool. I'll go and go through and um, clean up the data and see. Yeah. Check with my observers. Thank you. That's very helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Actually, if you have any pictures of that too, send it my way. Maybe that that's one way okay. I can like. I can do that. I've been thinking about yeah. making my emails a little bit more like graphics. Like here's some things we talked about last time and <laughs> some pictures of your guys' baby acorns and white leaves. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I want to see baby acorn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you guys have any other questions or anything before I get started? Um, well, just with confirming that we're um, doing the right plants, individuals that I've chosen and we've started observing, but again, before I enter them in the database and, and stuff, I know I can alter it later. Um, I do have two questions. One is um, distance apart when choosing a site and choosing individuals. I do have a couple of plants that are not three widths apart from each other. They're like two, two and a half widths apart. So they're a little closer than is suggested. And I'm just wondering if that's, you know, a big deal. Um, okay. No, like, yeah, no, that's okay. If, if they're close to each other. Like sometimes when you have a whole bunch of them that are close to each other, sometimes it's nice to... Um, you can count it as a patch. So if mm -hmm. you go to your plant, you can click like it's a patch and basically you include both. It depends on the plant, right? It's just those little nuances, right? Like sometimes it's easier sure. when there's a whole bunch of them close to each other, just call it a patch. And then when you're doing your observations, just do it all like together. Like if I have five milkweeds right next to each other, it doesn't make a ton of sense to do each individual milkweed, but when the patch in general how many flowers are you seeing and, mm -hmm. and how many leaves mm -hmm. are you seeing um so it just depends on the plant and how individual okay. it seems and um how okay. big it is even too like it doesn't make a super lot of sense to do like i i've got three oaks right next to each other so they're a patch of oaks like um it's so better right. to do the individual yeah. trees um, in this case it's california buckeye and they are in a buckeye grove and i'm trying to get some variation amongst ah. them some are, in, some are more shaded by oak some are more in an open meadowy area some are more by the riparian habitat um oh. so just trying for variety and these two just really called to me and the accessibility because I'm huge on the accessibility um mm -hmm. so okay so thanks for confirming that I, I was like I think it's okay um, I think it's okay and I'm looking at them now and they look like a big because people you guys say these plants and that's why I can't remember the names either <laughs> But yeah, that looks like a big plant. So yeah, definitely they're fine yeah. close to each other and doing the individuals, okay. you'll still get variation. Yep. Okay, cool. You're cool. doing yeah, great. Yeah, two that are kind of close. Um, about um, data and updating past data, I know Elizabeth is going to be looking through like stuff for the um, bittersweet and I'm going to be, you know, just doing that on my own site because I actually realized an error in the way I'm doing something. Um, but I know I can re go back and and adjust it. And I'm just wondering, you know, because I do everything um, on the computer, I do it on the website. I know one of our observers is using the app, but um, like the last data entered 
is the only one I can see. So how do you go about, do I need to re-enter the date at the top? Do you know what I mean with the drop down whole thing where it gives you like three columns? Do I need to re-enter the date based on my data sheet and put I in the believe, correct stuff and will it change? Oh, if <laughs> Elizabeth knows off the top of your head, go for it. Cause I don't do this very often. So I was just gonna go back and remember how to do it. But yeah, if you know, go for it. Um, so I, I just triaged this problem for an observer. So hopefully it's the same one um, that you're having. When you're in that, like, when you're on that page where you can sort of view the, the columns of the data that you've entered and you've got the, like, the three columns and you're saying you yes. can only see, like, one, right? The most um, recent one's on the left, yeah. The most recent one is on the left. Um, somewhere in the, like, blob of text at the top of the page where there's like maybe a drop down to show the email addresses of your different observers um, and maybe like the date or the site name. There's also these tiny little blue arrows that point left mm. and point right. And mm. so if you click on those, they go back in time or forward in time and you can see past or, or more future. Um, like if you've gone back a few, you can go forward a few um so ho hopefully that is um able to help you <laughs> help you see your data thank you that sounds perfect yeah. i i will look for those um and that does make me think sam if you're still in the website um adjustment process maybe those arrows might be more prominent or something yeah i know yeah oh oh please feedback no i was gonna say yeah, like yeah i know there's like changes we want to make to that um, part of the, like your the observer, uh, oh my gosh, the observation deck. Um, and especially, yeah, finding some of that information we've been working on. Um, but knowing about those arrows is actually really nice. And Elizabeth, what did you want to mention too? I forget now. <laughs> we were talking about the arrows and then we were talking right. about, okay. The, uh, um, We're talking about the arrows and then. And then changes for the new website. And it sounded like you had a suggestion too of something that was hard to find because it was hard to find these arrows. Yes. Nope, it's not coming to me. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I get distracted because I'm pulling up my observation deck to like hopefully maybe show. Um, yeah, so I'm on my observation deck, I've scrolled well, way down to the bottom. There's the four, um, you know, khaki colored boxes. The far right one says enter observations. And I clicked on enter observation data. Um, and so now that page is loading. And loading and loading. Mine's also stuck loading. Are you trying to get to the group data? Uh, nope, just enter observation data. Okay. I'm trying um, to... Yeah. And... I'll go for it. Um, oh, okay. And then, and then on the enter observation page, mm -hmm. there's like that little, there's like that block of text that talks about like, yes, no question mark, and then select your site, select your observer. Um, and then there's a, a row that says review submitted observations. And there's little blue arrows that point left and point right. Um, and one says three columns and one says one column. I don't know why. And then there's one that has like a little box that you can enter data in. I don't know. I've only ever used <laughs> that first one that says three columns with the, the left arrow and the right arrow. Gotcha. I see it. I see that too. And if I go back, okay. Okay, I see what you're talking about. Thank you so much. I remember what I was gonna say. Um, hey, it was about the, the website versus the app. So the, the app is really like basically just a data sheet. Like there's not a whole lot you can do. You can like go into the calendar and see your past data. And sometimes I'll do that because I'll be like, Oh, hey, I'm seeing this phenophase. I wonder if I saw it the last time I was out because 
I observe with a group um, of people and we split weeks and it may sometimes it's like two weeks since I've been out um, and so you can go back and you can look at your historic data but doing any sort of editing it's really cumbersome um, so I, I do all of it on the, the website as well yeah okay that's what I'll be doing yeah I just have to go back and, and change my my um abundances for one of my plants <laughs> based on updated understanding. <laughs> but thank you so much, Elizabeth. That helps a lot. Of course. Yeah, thank you. And yes, and, and also, especially what I'm just gonna just reassure you, right? Especially when it's your first year for your program, it's like your pilot year and there's just gonna be a ton of learning curves. Um, when I had my first year for a local phonology program, like my report just had all the things that I learned and all the things I wish I'd done differently. And I had added like a ton of animals when I first started and I made like one trip out there and I deleted like almost all the animals afterwards because <laughs> I realized I can't train volunteers on how to do the birds and that's not really part of our question. So yes, it's totally fine and um, you'll get the hang of it and it's going to be great. Um, and I just want to say hi to Wendy, who popped in. Welcome, Wendy. Hi. hi. Oops, can you hear me? <laughs> yes, I can hear you. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Sorry. Yeah, I, I kind of forgot about the call. So oh, that's totally fine. Do you want to introduce yourself real quick? It's okay if you can't have your camera on, but just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your program. Um, so I am the assistant phonology leader at the McDowell Sonoran Conservancy in the Scottsdale, Arizona area. We actually just had a one of our group days this morning, so, so I'm a little bit late. We had we had six, oh, including myself, seven of us out there looking at plants and things. Um, so yeah, we have three sites in our preserve. Our preserve's over thirty thousand acres. Uh, we got a lot of ground to cover, so we have one in the north, one in the central, one in the south part of the preserve. So it's interesting. I'm I look at two of those three regularly. It's interesting. They're at least a couple of weeks apart and when things happen, like bloom and fruit. So some of the saguaro fruit are ripening at one of them and they're not, you know, they're just coming now in the other part. So yeah, it's been interesting. So yeah, uh, that's me. <laughs> That's great. I love your guys' program. You guys have been doing your program for quite a while. And I think you've got some cool data on the swallows and the um, white wing doves, right? Yes. Um, yeah. So we started monitoring the white wing doves on uh, 2020. And I think the rest of them were around 2016 or 2017. So not quite as long as our plants. But um, yeah, so we were able to do the graphs and seen so far that they appear to be in sync with the white wing doves and the saguaros. We've seen weird activity this year, though, with our mesquites and doing some weird things like I don't know if the fruit is either diseased or it doesn't seem like it's ripening well. Um, I don't know. Maybe it's the up and down temperatures we've had. I can't quite figure it out. So I was going to send some photos to our local botanist here and see if he has any clues. But um, but yeah, we've been doing it for quite a while. And our, our scientists that we have on staff say they, they they might not even look at the data till we have 10 years of data. So I don't know yet. Um, we're in year seven or eight, I think. So we have a few more years to collect data before we know what's going on, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. I love your guys' program. Thank you so much for being able to make it today. Yeah, sorry. I missed half of it already. <laughs> oh, no, you're fine. You're totally fine. All right, so, and then did you have any questions actually? Cause we, we just kind of answered some questions before I got into like, here's how to make pivot tables, but do you have any questions? Um, so about... you haven't done the pivot tables part yet. No, not yet. You didn't miss that part. Oh, yeah, sure. that's what I'm, I mean, I've seen it done a couple times before. I'm sure I did it once or twice at work in the working world, but it's been way too long. So I, I don't know how that goes. You know what I don't, I don't, we don't ever seem to have, let me go to one of our page, is when I'm in my, I'll manage my users and we can you know we can download individual people's data but when it comes to group data that always just spins and spins and I think maybe because we're such a large group and we've been doing it for so long it doesn't seem like it ever can download all the group data at once so I've only been able to do like an individual person at a time I don't know if you have any thoughts on that my thoughts on that are I literally just tried that as I was answering these guys' questions and I got the spins and spins also. So my thought is that I'm going to email IT 
at the end of this call and let them know that that's been happening and that other people had it too. So actually I'm really yeah. happy that you brought that up because yeah, I thought it was just me because my computer's being a little bit slow. Um, and it was it's like, we were just talking about group data and I was just trying to play with the group data and I couldn't, and I was just getting really frustrated and they're like, oh, we've got it, but. It's never worked <laughs> for us. Yeah, we've never been able to get that to work. I didn't know if our data set was just too large. <laughs> No, because basically how that works is you're essentially like, it's kind of automatically putting a filter on um, the phenology observation portal that you could go to the phenology observation portal and download filtered data that just has your group's data. But that link should take you just like straight to be essentially doing those filters. So right. that's weird that it's not working. Yeah, that's our main, I think our main thing right now, but uh, yeah. Our Pivot tables. Is, I'm glad I came in when I did then. <laughs> yes. All right. Um. So, and speaking of which, I've been like trying to download um some data and it's taking a bit. So let me go to my downloads though. And I know I've got, I've got previous data that I've had to, oh, there it is. Um, so I'll show you guys how to, the pivot table. And the reason why I wanted to specifically do pivot tables is I had a few meetings recently with people who are like, how do we do pivot tables again? Or how can I see this particular data, like how can I see how many observers um, were observing on a certain plant species or what what phenophases we got. Um, and when you have those big Excel sheets, pivot tables are just a really nice way to be able to um, organize that data. So I'm gonna open, open my Excel sheet here and then I'll share my screen. Oh man, my laptop is telling me that I did not reset it recently and that I've been doing too many things and that I have too many tabs. Um, so let me see if I can get it going. Oh, there we go. I just wanted to open the file. Um, and I make these all the time. So if you guys get any of our like newsletters that are like the Nectar Connectors newsletters or anything like that, um, and I'm and you see where I'm like. Oh, we have X number of observers who observe swarrows, and you know, 43 observers did um, agave or something like that. I get that from downloading Nectar Connectors or um, whichever campaign's data, and then I make pivot tables. So now it's working, which is great. And so I'll show you guys how to do this. And this is a video I kind of make it want to make a short video for this available too, because it's just such great information. So when you download, um, download your data right you get the status intensity observation data and then you get this all mess right and this is just the worst to try to get through um and do, 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 no i just don't worry about document recovery so the, the way to make a pivot table is when you have all this mess you go to insert right up here and then you go to pivot table and then you say okay and it makes this nice blank sheet. And when you look down here, it's just another tab, right? So here you still have all, all your messy data. And then right here. So let's say I want to see how many people or how many local phenology programs even um, have been collecting data on saguaros. So to do that, I'll pick the common name of the species um, in my rows. So I took common name. I moved it down here to rows. And these are all the species that people have collected data on for flowers for bats this year. So I don't really know the technicalities of like what magic thing happened to make it do this. But I know if I wanna see how many species were observed, I put it down here on rows on common name. And then if I wanna see how many programs participated, Oh, I don't think I included that. Let me see if I have, I don't have group, but I can look up sites. So site ID will tell me how many different sites collected the data on those. And here it's telling me there were, if I had filtered the data a bit more carefully while I was downloading it, I would have put in that I do want the local phenology program's name. I just forgot to do that. Um, but for site numbers, I can just highlight this. And down here at count 22, it tells me 22 sites 
observed saguaros. So there's 22 different like sites across Arizona that have ob been observing saguaros. For Palmer Century Plant, I can see that there are 18 sites that collected data on Palmer Century Plants. Now, if I wanna say like how many, um, like let's say you have like several local phenology programs and you wanna see like how many people were collecting data on those, when you're going to the phenology observation portal, you can select under partner groups, you can select which programs you want to observe. I didn't click partner groups and that's why it's not showing the local phenology programs, um, but this is how I can tell how many. Now, if I wanna see how many um, saguaro observations there were, um, I'll go back down to the rows. I don't wanna worry about sites, but if I wanna see how many saguaro observations our site did. So I'm saying like, this is how many observations we had. I put um, observation ID because each observation you make has an ID number. I put it here in values and that's a crazy number. And that's because the default is to do a sum. So I just go from sum of observations, I go to value field settings, and then I go to count of the observation ID. So for flowers for bats this year so far, observers, there were 6,000 observations. That includes like your nest, yes and no and question mark observations. Um, Peri's agave, it shows the how many observations of Peri's agave they were, et cetera. If I wanna say how many observers, how many individual people were observing it, I think I've got observa observer ID. Maybe I, I might not have put observer ID. Uh, I didn't put observer ID, but I can see how many individual saguaros there were. So here under, um, not species ID, individual ID here, this is how many individual saguaros or individual of each was in there. So I can go to individual ID. I can go to values. Once again, it's like sum. You don't want to have a sum. You want to have a count of how many IDs there were or how many individuals there were. Uh, I want, uh, that's not the right number, oops. Because that was the number of observations. So that might be the wrong one. I had the site ID was correct. Oh, maybe I, that's because I want it here. Yep, that was it. So how many saguaros were counted? I needed to put it in the rows, not in the count. So the individual saguaros, there are 47 saguaros that people are observing. And I can even see like per site, I can put site ID down here. So here's all the different sites that are observing these different cactus. So this site, they're observing one, this site, they're observing three, this site, they're observing four. Oh. So basically every time you put something, a new field down here in the rows, it kind of gives you that extra, like that kind of tiered step of how many um, like observers or individual observations or um, sites that were observing those plants. Hmm. And I can even do, I think, do we have, uh, so you can do intensity, you can do abundance. You can do day of year, so you can even have like what day of year were people first observing flowers on my plant. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these you can get with the visualization tool as well, right? And that's why the visualization tool is so nice is because with the visualization tool, you have a nice graph and you can like hover over it and you can see exactly what day of year it came up without having to do the pivot tables. But if you're doing some basic reporting on how many um, how many observations of um, each different plant did, that we had, that's an, a nice little pivot table. This is how, this is how you can do that. Um, it's okay if you don't remember it exactly. I do these for all my email messages. Um, and the first few times I did those emails, I had to email Aaron like constantly. I was like, Aaron, how do I do pivot tables again? Um, so that's why it's nice that I'm recording this. I'm going to be uploading it um, because it's nice to have that refresher. 
But this is nice if you're emailing your volunteers and you want to let them know, this is how many observations you guys made this month. This is a very nice way to be able to quickly filter um, how many observations your volunteers made for that month. Because then when you're downloading the data, you can filter it by like only January or only February, right? And then you can go to, you can put in your species and then you can put a filter it by number of observations. And then you can tell them you guys made X number of observations today on this many plants. And we had five volunteers who came and we do have that data dashboard where you can get that information as well. Um, but some people just like doing it with pivot tables to get those numbers. And it's just different ways to be able to view and visualize that data and be able to report your data to um, your stakeholders or your volunteers. Mm -hmm. So before I go away from this, do you guys have any questions about it? Yeah, I think the confusing it's, part was to know wh whether to put it in rows or vet, like which one of those boxes to drag things down to. They, that was helpful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Usually it's rows. And you can see even too, I put it in values. I was like, this doesn't make sense. Oh, I was supposed to put it in rows, right? Like, um, and so, yes, you'll notice when you put something in there, you'll be like, wait, that didn't make sense. And the order that you do it is important as well, right? So, for example, I'll take out individual ID. I just have site ID and common name. So with site, when I have the common name at the top, it filters first or it organizes it, not filters, but it organizes it first by common name. If I switch these and I put site ID first, mm -hmm. then it does it by site ID and then the species within the sites. So you can even play with the order that you put things in when you're trying to figure out how you wanna organize that data. See, so yeah, I have phenophase ID, but I, I should have organized that a little differently. It's okay if it doesn't make a lot of sense, but what I would recommend doing is if you can get that download group data to work, go ahead and do that. Um, in the meantime though, I'm gonna show you guys the phenology observation portal and how you can get that information for your program. So I'm gonna stop sharing real quick so that I can switch my screen because I'm just too awkward at switching the screen from that uh, date range. All right, so I'm gonna share my screen again. And so here's our phenology observation portal. You can find this by going to, um, if you go to usanpn.org, you can click on data and then go down to observational data. Go to the portal. And this is where you can also download Excel spreadsheets. So um, if you're just looking at like, what did we observe? What were our observers doing? Um, what phenophases were observed? You click on status and intensity. Let's say we wanna do it for just this year. I'll go to January 1st up until today, which is, oh my gosh, the middle of June. Um, I'm not super worried about location. And right now I'm not super worried about species because I want to go to my group. So let's say I want to go to, where's, is McDowell's called McDowell? Because I'm thinking of you guys right now. Yeah, I don't know if they first have it under Phoenix, though. If you can't find it under MC, you might type in Phoenix. See. You start typing McDowell. <laughs> there it is. Yep, there we go. So I can click here. And so now it's, it's going to just give me McDowell's data. I usually pick that first one that says Nature's Notebook. Does that matter? You know, that doesn't really matter because you've already filtered it by your group's data. It's only going to be the data that you guys collected. Mm -hmm. um, if you were looking at data across the entire United States and you just wanted Nature's Notebook data, then you would do just Nature's Notebook data. But here's where I can remember. See, now it says partner group because I'll have the partner group name. 
but you can have the name of your sites on here. So let's say you want to report on what each of your sites had. You can filter it by with site name. I really wanted to have Phenophase name, which is um, which was one of the ones I was like, oh, I want the name where it shows actually like flowers, right? And then here you have submitted by person ID or observed by person ID. So this is where you can see how many observers were included. And if you're not sure and you select them all with the pivot table, it'll just give you more options with your pivot table, but you can still figure out which ones you actually wanted. Um, but I think it's better to just pick a few that you have. And then so then I'll click next. And then I'll click um, site visit details. If you have comments or anything that you want to note in that, you can include your site visit details. If you want the IDs of all your observers, you can have that here and the IDs of your individual, individual plants and sites that's here. Um, but that's like a whole extra spreadsheet. So I'm not gonna do that right now. Um, so we'll see, but that's how you get your data sheet. If that just group data part doesn't quite work, um, or if it didn't have all the fields that you wanted it to have, you can go to the phenology observation portal um, and filter it then by what you wanted. Make sure you use the filter when you go to the phenology observation portal, because if you have no filters and then you just click download, um, it will download all of our 30 million records. And that takes a long time. And it's the worst when you accidentally do that. I did that once when I first started here. <laughs> I didn't, I forgot to do the filters. And it's like, why is this thing still downloading? There's this huge Excel file. Um, so we aren't kidding when we say everything's available, like everything's available. Um, Asterix, please use your filters when you're looking for specific data because otherwise we'll be a one. I'll see if um, it downloaded yet. Uh, downloads. And then with your pivot tables too, just so you know, for some reason, the comma separated thing won't save your pivot tables. So you'll wanna make sure that you save it as an actual Excel sheet, not as the comma, um, comma delineated format if you wanna save your spreadsheet because it won't save your pivot tables unless you go to file and then save as, and save it as just a, a, a spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna insert once again, a pivot table. Um, we're going to insert a pivot table. Yes. So now we have um, McDowell's group. So here I can filter by now when I filter by partner group, because I actually selected that I wanted the partner group names. There it shows it. And then I can show now I, I also chose site names. So there's your site. Oh, that's, yeah, that's great. And then um, observed by person ID. Um, Whoops. I want this to be bigger. I can't really change that though. I wish the boxes were bigger to when you're shopping. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> and I'm sure there is an easier way to do that that I just don't know. And Erin would be like, oh, all you have to do is this. She's really good at it. Here we go. Here's all the, this is this many observers that you had for each of your sites. Sounds about right. Yep. Which is cool. And then, whoops. And if you do that where you accidentally like click away, and you're like, oh no, I lost my pivot table fields. You just click on it again and it comes right back. I've done that so many times. Um, common name. So let's say I wanna take out observe by person ID, common name. And there we go. So now you have, here's all your sites. And then you have the common names of all the plants at your sites. And then um, let's see, I can do observation ID. Let's see if I can get it down there. I think if you click it in the correct order, like when you're clicking these in the correct order, it'll do it right. And then you don't have to do all this. Maybe down in rows, once you highlight it, you could use the arrows. I don't know if that works. Yeah, I don't, uh. I don't know. Oh, maybe, is that site name? But anyway, we'll awkwardly go through this together. There we go. So at Brown's Ranch, Buckhorn Choya. So what are those? These are all the observations of Choya that you guys made. 
So you can actually, if you want to say how many, so how many observations of buckthorn choya, and this includes the yeses or the noes. And then you, do, 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 do. this one's taken a while because you guys have lots and lots of observations from this year, um, but however many rows you highlight. But I think this might be one where you can put it into values. And I can do value field count. So what value field count should do is, oh dear. You have like over 600 rows, it looks like. Yeah, I know, right? Okay. It should say how many observations did we have of these? And that includes the yeses or no for each phenophase. Mm -hmm. um, but then that will show you all those observations because I did count. And that you, you punched in everything this 2023. Yeah, yeah this is just 2023. Okay. So it can, you can get a little lost in it sometimes, but once you get the hang of it and practice it a few times, and even like once you get the hang of it, like, oh my gosh, this is how I did it like just redo it again a few times to like get it in your brain. Oh, that's how it helps me anyway, or, you know, write it down like most normal people do. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I, I like to practice it a few times so I get the muscle memory down. Um, but it, it gets kind of fun, the data that you can see um, using the pivot tables. Oh, so maybe here's where we could use intensity value because the graphs the visualization tool is only showing like uh what is that called the the proportion yes records or something yeah so i've never done intensity value before. let me see if i can i don't know exactly what it will like i guess we'll see here right so i've got my unless that goes under. but i think there's a way that you could do like I'll take out partner group. I'll take out site name, um, intensity value. Um, so it'll show the intensity values that you did. Categories, yeah. It's got the categories, but there's a way. Um, but oh. you can, like when you do the. Abundance value? No. That's the same. That's the same thing. Let me, yeah. I, well, I think there might be a day of year one that you can. Hmm. Oh, I don't remember. I think this the nine minus nine 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 is when people said unsure. Unsure. Um, yeah. So this was unsure. Okay. Yeah. But I think this is where this is what people reported on the day of year. I think. You'd have to look, a, I'd have to play with this a little bit more because I haven't done intensity. Erin might know that one and I can check with her. Um, and it might be also like, yes, this is the value that may have been reported mm -hmm. for these on these days of year. And also this is not showing the individual plants, right? This is showing for all your plants. So you could have some that are three to 10, some that are less than 5%. Um, Oh, and because you have this, it's it's also not showing the flowers. So you'd want to have the phenophase name with it. So flowers and flower buds, for example. So now what you're seeing is for buckthorn choya, what did people report for flowers or flower buds? And so what this is showing is like um, either no intensity or unsure for intensity for all those. But here on day 65, uh, 11 to 100 was reported at some point and three to 10 was reported at some point. I think the 999 would mean nothing because there wouldn't have been anything blooming before then anyway. Yeah, exactly. It means that, that the person either entered no or they entered unsure for that one. Um, so I'd have to think more into it that I won't be able to today, um, but it's something you can play around with. At least you can see how you can play around with these data. And also when you're filtering, um, filtering for exactly what it is that you might be looking for with that.
So I know that wasn't the most successful or comprehensive, like here's how you can do all the things, but at least that's how you make a pivot table and how you can organize things in those rows and in those values um, to start being able to see some of those numbers for your data. Thanks for doing that, that's cool. <laughs> Yeah, it's actually really neat. I'd never made pivot tables before I came here. And Aaron's like, here's how you make pivot tables. I was like, oh my gosh, it like blew my mind. So I do try to share those whenever I can. That's probably a lot better than, I was just doing like data. There was another function where you just go in a cell, you push data uh, filter and it'll have the little arrows on each column, but this pivot table seems a little bit more robust. <laughs> Yeah, and there might be an easier way. Like I was like kind of struggling with the rows. I'm sure if I was actually sitting and taking the time to try to figure that out, I bet there's a way to expand on it. Um, I just have never taken the time to actually do that because I've never had to do too many layers of rows before. Thank you. Yeah, you guys are welcome. Thank you so much, Sam. Um, thank you for your questions and for coming to this and and all the things that you do and all the work that you guys do and um I, it's always a joy to see you all so thanks for being here um with that i'm gonna go ahead and stop recording